As the U.S. scrambles to withdraw from Afghanistan and complete the evacuation, the same Republicans who supported Donald Trump's deal with the Taliban to withdraw are now shamelessly piling on and trying to erase history. For more on this, it's time for a closer look. In order to claim that what's happening in Afghanistan right now came out of nowhere, you have to willfully ignore or erase 20 years of history in which the Washington elite repeatedly lied about how the war was going, which is exactly what so many in the media, and especially the right-wing ghouls who got us into this mess, the Karl Roves and John Boltons of the world have been doing. Donald Trump himself, the guy who negotiated the deal with the Taliban to release prisoners and withdraw by May, has been on TV claiming he would have handled the situation better. And for some reason, he's going out of his way to compliment the Taliban on their fighting and negotiating skills. Taliban, great negotiators, tough fighters, great negotiators. The Taliban, good fighters. I will tell you, they're good fighters. We have to give them credit for that. No, you don't. You don't have to give the Taliban credit for anything. They're the Taliban. It's especially insane to call them good negotiators like they're trying to talk down a used car salesman. This car has a lot of miles on it, but it runs like a champ. Give it to me for free or I'll murder your family. Oh, all right, tough but fair, Mr. Taliban. Let me talk to my manager and he's dead. I'm gonna get you the keys. Does Trump think if he's nice to the Taliban, they'll hang out with him? Great fighters, great negotiators, and great, great golfers. Abdul Ghani Baradar, horrible guy, but I saw him eagle a par five from the rough. We played in a foursome with Brooks Kepka and Bryson DeChambeau, and you want to talk about warring factions. Those two do not like each other. I mean, thank God this idiot wasn't the chief of police in San Francisco during the Zodiac killings. Bad guy, nasty guy, but you gotta give him credit for one thing. Beautiful, beautiful penmanship. And I love those little puzzles. It reminds me of the New York Times spelling bee. We love the pangram, don't we, folks? Don't we love the pangram, Trump voters? If you don't know what the pangram is, you don't want to know. It'll destroy your life. Just try. It is an evil game. Yesterday, I spent 11 hours on it, and then I finally got genius. And when I told my kids, they said, we haven't eaten yet today. <laughs> and then there was Trump's former White House press secretary, Kayleigh McEnany. Ooh, pangram. Nope, never mind. I didn't use the F. Who went on Fox yesterday and made it clear she's fully inhabiting an alternate reality. Look, when President Trump was president, Ooh. you didn't see crisis after crisis. You just didn't see it. I, I shudder to think about what COVID would have been like under Joe Biden. Well, she's right about one thing. You didn't see crisis after crisis if you were watching Fox. More than 400,000 Americans died from COVID under Trump. Also, he got it, and his rallies and White House parties were super spreaders. Trump personally help spread more disease to more people than a community swimming pool filled with water from the East River. All right, everybody, out of the deep end. We got another mobster. Give me the lung a pole thing with the hook on it. You kids want to see what happens when you sing to the feds? <laughs> Trump's entire presidency was crisis after crisis. His presidency was such a disaster. When it started, I had an audience, and now we cut to Wally so often, he's getting offers to do Scorsese movies. Just one thing, Marty, I don't curse. No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm just with you, buddy. Take the sunglasses off. <laughs> to say Trump didn't cycle through crises after crisis is to ignore that much of his inner circle got indicted. His cabinet had like half a dozen corruption scandals. He praised Nazis, kidnapped migrant children, fired or tried to fire the people investigating him, got caught paying hush money to a porn star, incited a violent insurrection to overthrow an election, helped Saudi Arabia cover up a murder, single-handedly caused the longest government shutdown in American history, and told the Boy Scouts a story about yachts and New York parties. When I was young, there was a man named William Levitt, and he was a very successful man, and he went out and bought a big yacht, and he had a very interesting life. I won't go any more than that because you're Boy Scouts, so I'm not going to tell you what he did. <laughs> Should I tell you? Should I tell you? Oh, you're Boy Scouts, but you know life. You know life. <laughs> That's a thing. That's a thing that happened. A bunch of 12-year-olds who wanted to learn, I don't know, about knots. <laughs> and he's up there saying, I don't know if you gave out badges for having three ways and blowing rails, but if you did, oh, you would have run out in the 80s. You're Boy Scouts, you know. Look, I'm not saying Joe Biden doesn't screw up or make mistakes. He does. Watching him take questions from reporters can feel like watching the ground screw roll out a tarp in a hurricane. Don't worry, they got it, they got it. Oh, oh God, oh! 
The tarp just swallowed Mr. Met. Of course, based on what's been happening at City Field recently, I think Mr. Met would happily embrace the sweet release of death. <laughs> We're gonna get you out of there, Mr. Met! Leave me to die! <laughs> so Biden certainly has made mistakes. It's not like the withdrawal and evacuation have been flawless. Even if it's the right thing to do, it, even if the chaos was inevitable after 20 years of a failed quagmire, the foreign policy establishment repeatedly lied about. For one thing, the U.S. should evacuate and grant asylum to any vulnerable Afghan who wants to come here, period. A community organizer helping to evacuate vulnerable Afghans wrote in the New York Times yesterday, we are coordinating on different platforms and languages often all at once. We're figuring out what Taliban checkpoints to avoid and what gate at the airport is the most accessible, if any are. We're raising money, millions of dollars overnight, to charter planes. We're endlessly compiling spreadsheets with information about Afghans who are under threat from the Taliban. We're doing this because the American government isn't. That's inexcusable. Shouldn't be on volunteers and human rights activists alone to figure out which gates are most accessible in Kabul since it's not even an easy task at LaGuardia. At LaGuardia, there are no gates. You just walk onto the tarmac and hail a flight the way you would a cab. I swear, one time I printed out my boarding pass for a LaGuardia flight to Los Angeles and it told me to go to gate 765 in Terminal Z near the haunted Cinnabon. I should note, we have to get our LaGuardia jokes in while we can because they're doing a major renovation and it looks like it's gonna be pretty nice, which sucks because LaGuardia is a perfect comedy word. It's the Kalamazoo of airports and yesterday's Pangram. I'm starting to think the crew's not doing the spelling bee. <laughs> Nonetheless, getting out is the right thing to do and Americans support it. In fact, Americans have wanted us to get out of this war for a long time. Polls have shown that as many as 73% of Americans want it to end, 73%. Part of the problem is for years, the media has all but ignored Afghanistan. But you know who wasn't ignoring the war? Defense contractors, the Cost of War Project at Brown University estimates that since invading Afghanistan in 2001, the United States has spent $2.3 trillion on the war. And The Intercept calculated that $10,000 invested in defense stocks when the Afghanistan war began is now worth almost $100,000 because defense stocks outperformed the stock market overall by 58% during the Afghanistan war. Now, you don't have to know much about the stock market to know that defense contractors profit from war, which is why the Washington elite are freaking out. The same reason your weed dealer freaked out when they legalized it. What am I supposed to do? Get a job? Sell coke? Oh, that's it. I'll sell coke. <laughs> also, I should clarify, I have no idea how the stock market works. All I know is my broker calls me once a day and tells me how my portfolio is looking. No, oh, that's him now, hold on. Hey, how's it looking? <gasps> you invested in the Mets, when? Three weeks ago? What money did you use? You sold our LaGuardia stock. That's about to go sky high. <laughs> so the media has ignored Afghanistan for years and elite Washington has lied to us about it as documented by the Washington Post blockbuster reporting on what were known as the Afghanistan Papers in which government officials secretly admitted we clearly failed in Afghanistan and we didn't know what we were doing. And the US occupation of Afghanistan began 20 years ago and for basically that entire period our government has shielded us from the reality of what was happening. George W. Bush and Donald Rumsfeld even went so far as to make grandiose predictions about how the war would be viewed by history, despite what they really knew was happening behind the scenes. The history of military conflict in Afghanistan. It's been one of initial success, followed by long years of floundering and ultimate failure. We're not gonna repeat that mistake. What has taken place in the last four years in Afghanistan is an historic achievement. And the people who've been involved in it can be enormously proud. And, and history will look back on it as having been an amazing accomplishment. I'm honestly not sure if these guys were ever right about anything ever. Like, these guys were so wrong about so many things, there's a good chance Don Rumsfeld wasn't even his real name. It sounds like an alias Dick Whitman would use to get a job at Raytheon. Suffice to say, history will not look back on it as an amazing accomplishment. If anything, I think it's much more likely that when they get to the chapter on Afghanistan, future textbooks will just say, file not found. Of course, in the future, there probably won't be textbooks. You'll just get all your history downloaded in a chip that you put in your brain. Okay, activate the chip. <laughs> he said what to the Boy Scouts? <laughs> and hey, it's one thing to be wrong. I make mistakes all the time. As anyone who watches our 
Emmy-nominated correction segment will tell you, voting now open. But what the Bushes and Rumsfelds and Boltons and Roves did was so much worse because they lied and covered up the truth. While they were cheerleading, and making all of those confident predictions in public, in private, we now know they had no idea what the they were doing. Despite declaring the war an amazing accomplishment, Rumsfeld repeatedly wrote panic memos about the situation in Afghanistan. In 2003, he wrote, I have no visibility into who the bad guys are. In 2002, he ended one memo by writing the word help with an exclamation point. And two months after the US invaded, Rumsfeld wrote to an aide, please give me a piece of paper showing me the languages spoken in Afghanistan. I feel like it would have been preferable to get that information before invading. It's like an old Western where the marshal kicks in the door of a Mexican cantina. Hey, everyone, throw your guns on the ground. Oh, right. Hmm. Oh, boy. Uh, Todos? <laughs> um, Armas? <laughs> it's been a while, guys. <laughs> Elite Washington lied to us for 20 years about the war, telling us it was a historic achievement and that we were close to victory, when in reality, they knew and admitted in private that it was a disaster. And now, the right-wing ghouls who got us into this mess are opining shamelessly on cable news about how they would have handled the situation and the pro-Trump crowd that negotiated and celebrated the deal with the Taliban to withdraw are hypocritically piling on Biden for following through. But then again, you probably expected that would happen because... You know life. You know life. This has been Closer Look. God's Love We Deliver cooks and brings over 2 million meals a year to men, women, and children living with HIV, AIDS, cancer, and other serious illnesses, and they need your help now more than ever. If you're watching this online, you can hit the donate button. Stay safe, get vaccinated. We love you.